I would like to start my speech by saying that communication has evolved immensely over the past century. We've gone from needing better ways to communicate with one another to constantly trying to stay in touch with each other. And as a person who has a high interest on social media, there has been one question that I failed to answer, and that is the very topic of this, set, of this speech. Do our actions on social media matters? And also, I believe that everyone here are well adequate and also are quite knowledgeable about the topics. So the thing about this, it would be the question, which is very related to a Marvel series. Do you feel like you are Thanos when you are online? But instead of snapping your finger and making half of the population disappear, you could just literally do so right now with just a few touch of a button on your electronic devices. And all of these actions could be well interpreted as an indicator or a pattern to which would lead to cyberbullying. But the question here would be, what exactly is cyberbullying? There are many researchers and also many scholars are having a hard time defining what cyberbullying is. The term itself, the word itself is very broad and also very complex. And, but there are notions to where we can understand this. And at the very core of it, cyberbullying is an action done by an individual or a group toward a person or a group to make them feel hurtful through electronic means. And honestly, all of these things are done repeatedly and over time. And these are the two words that, will be, that we will be focusing on. So on to these matters, we should look into all of those aspects to where we can all focus upon. And that is that many researchers have shown victims of cyberbullying may have psychological impacts on them, such as having low self-esteem, anxiety, stress, and the worst case scenario is that they may end up taking their own lives. And According to my very own research on cyberbullying, a behavior among youth, on students, it has shown that victims of cyberbullying may also take up cyberbullying traits and cyberbully others as well. This means that all they need to do is just to have a great ICT knowledge or information and communication technologies. And this knowledge, we can all require by just having a great understanding of social media. For example, if you know how to use Photoshop, you could just edit my face or anyone's face and put it on an animal or a meme and to make fun of them. And these are all repeated actions. So how do we define or how do we know uh, that those kind of actions are cyberbullying? Well, there are theories and string to it to know where or what kind of action or nature of cyberbullying is. And these are the three theories which are the online disinhibition effects, the audience effect, and also the de-individualization. All of these three are the components or the theories to which we can use to understand the nature and the beginning of cyberbullying. And I would like to say that the start of cyberbullying, these three theories with the mixture of a power, a power of anonymity. The power of anonymity here refers to a bubble or a space where we can do all our actions online with no one punishing us, with no one knowing us, identifying us, and also put us into a place where we can be accountable and responsible for our actions. And I would like to start with the online disinhibition effects. This is well means that when we are online, we tend to act in a more exaggerated version of ourselves. We tend to be more aggressive more impulsive, and also we became more irrational when it comes to online usage. Think of it this way, if we, are, if we posted a picture of ourselves on social media, there will be comments, the good ones and the bad ones. And all of those comments, I'm pretty sure that the bad one will stick with you the most. And all of those comments or the bad ones could be about your weight, your height, your acne or your skin colors, and the worst case scenario is that it could be even your mindset as well. And all of these things are an accumulative things which could hurt us 
online or even at our own house. And to this, let's say that as a media student, I tend to analyze the things that I saw online, the posts, the comments, and also the share that we do to our friends, our colleagues, and also our families. All of those accumulative things, we need to analyze it and think of it to know whether it is worth sharing or not. And also, when there's an argument or, or communication between one another, try to think of it this way. When they use opinions and not fact, try to be very skeptical of them. Because opinions means somehow nothing in this online world. Because we tend to be a more exaggerated version of ourselves. This means that we may say all those things when we are online, but we would never do so when we, do, when we saw them or would say those comments in real life. We would never do them when we are facing others face to face, but we would rather do it when we are on a cyberspace where no one can protect us or even can identify or punish them. And these are some of the adjectives that I would see a lot on social media, especially on news institutions. And they would use this phrase to emphasize or to give opinions to those facts or to those somehow make up facts. And those are kind of the words. Wow, Loi Men Ten. And all of these adjectives, recall, adjectives are, tend to be more opinionated. And all of these things could change our behavior on those contents to know whether it is real, it is fake, or it is just a make up news to confuse us and mislead information. As for the audience effect, I think the best example for this would be on the Black Lives Matter movement, because we would see a lot of blackout pictures posted on social media. It is great that we are raising an awareness to others. We are raising about the awareness of the disparity that black people are having, the racism that is happening over there. But also, posting a blackout picture means nothing if we misled the information. Because I remember that on the day that George Floyd died, no one is going to remember about him. All people would still remember about the blackout pictures rather than the information that is being portrayed by others. We tend to do this by following the social trend that everyone is doing. We follow others because everyone is doing it. And by doing all of this, it leads to another theory, and that is the deindividualization effects. It is quite too hard to pronounce, but this one is quite um, a mixture of everything as well, mixing with the audience effect and also the power of anonymity. The theory stated that when we are online, we tend to do more things or do those actions because no one's going to blame us. We will have zero accountability or responsibility toward our actions. And they believe by doing so because we are doing all those actions on social media where no one is going to know about it where we can just fake our name and do all those actions without no one knowing. So to this, the best example would be regarding a social trend that we have been doing because we have zero accountability toward other things. So within the study of many scholars and others, they have shown that by understanding media literacy, it is the best way to go and it is the best way to start and analyze the contents that we are seeing on social media. And by understanding and learning about media literacy, we can know what are facts and what are opinionated. And all of these would be well explained within the concept of 5W and 1H. I think most journalism students would know a lot about this and experience it and also work a lot around it as well. And this theory could help define us to understand the contents being posted on social media to know whether it's real or not, and to know whether it's meant for cyberbullying or to black out or to make other reputation in a bad way. So to understand what really happened, what is the situation over there, why did it happen, when did it happen, and also where did it happen, and also who was involved in this. And the best part of this is to understand how did it really happen, what caused this to stir up. So if we all look into this, we will all know why we post or why we comment or why people do all those actions. 
And to know this is to know their contents or their captions on each post. And to understand whether they are doing it because they are following the social trend or they are doing so because they want to raise an awareness. And categorizing, categorizing this and understanding this notion is where we could lead and understand more about cyberbullying and the action that we can use to prevent it and stop it from happening now and later on. So rather than blocking or reporting all the people, why can't we just talk about it? Because I believe that having a discussion or a talk with each other is better than blocking them or reporting them. Because they could just add or create another account to do all those actions. And they will feel no responsibility for their action as well. And by communication and communicating with them and discuss with them those topics about those arguments, we can find a better ground to where we know how to stop them and why they do what they do. Because we are now living in a cyberspace. Most students are spending more time on social media or online studying rather than going outside. And even us, working, working adults, we are working, some of us may be working from home because of the pandemics and even the community lockdown as well. So working from home and spending more time online is what we've been doing so far. So to understand this and to understand why we should stop blocking or reporting, but discuss in a very rational and free way to where we can find an answer to each and every one of them. And what would we be or where would we go if we can't feel safe when we are at our very own home? Thank you.